I'm here with um, my name is Alison. I'm from the Office for Disability at the ACT Government, and I'm here with Court Walters from uh, Araluen, an organisation in Victoria that supports people with disability. Um, and we met uh, using the wonders of technology uh, during the Having a Home Forum on the 16th of November 2018. But we had some technology issues, so Court has kindly agreed to talk with us again um, about the services he and our alum provide for people with disability who are looking for some innovative housing options. So take it away, Court. Thanks so much for joining us again. Thanks, Alison, and uh, thanks for letting me do my presentation again. Um, sorry about the technological uh, blunders, though, who think it was probably mine, but um, sure let's get know. right in. <laughs> let's get right in. So, um, thank you. Yeah, as, as Alison said, Court from Arrow my role is uh, investigating housing solutions manager. Um, so I've been overseeing a team of um, staff who are delivering support coordination specifically for people who are looking to explore their housing options, um, funded under the NDIS. Um, so we're a small service and we've got about 250 people we support. We've been doing this under the NDIS since 2016 and have been the main provider of housing specific support coordination um, in, since that time. Um, we're working with 55 people currently who have been funded by the NDIA for investigating housing solutions. So uh, Araluen um, has always had a, a really strong interest in housing and support and the way that people with disabilities um, live in the community and on best practice and good outcomes. Um, and so many years ago, about 10 years ago, um, Ara Lewin uh, went to their family groups and said, "Hey, you know, what's what's the really um, what are the really challenging things you're facing when you're thinking about housing um, for your adult children with disabilities?" And this is the question that kept coming up: "What's going to happen to my adult child when I'm no longer able to care for them?" And I think this is a question that uh, all Australian families um, of people with disabilities uh, face as time goes on. And so we thought, how can we address this question? So uh, Aradorn went and we canvassed the community and looked at the ways that people were living in the community. So uh, this is the start of our developing our resource, our models of housing and support resource. So um, we, we thought there'd be a few ways people were living in the community and um, you know, we, we looked at traditional models of support and we thought there'd be about you know, six to eight ways of people living in the community. We actually documented 30 different models of support and housing in our, uh, in our communities. And so we thought, gee, that's, that's amazing. We obviously don't need any more information. What we need to do is find out what's best practice and then move to scale. So, um, uh, and just the NDIS is now providing portable supports to employ direct staff and allied health. So it's, NDIS has made it a lot easier for us to try and scale some of these best practice models um, through, through portable funding. So uh, we found that planning for good outcomes is the answer over predetermination or, or uh, you know, our congregate care model. Um, people with disability find it harder to move out of home as they get older, um, as we all do, and uh, people with disability need to gain skills and experiences outside of the family home, uh, such as, as, uh, as going to respite or having some kind of transition and gauging of independent living skills and needs and requirements. Um, for moving out of home, um, and the NDIS is now funding this through IHS. So Araluen's resource has um, the, the, our models of housing and support matrix, which is kind of the backbone of our thinking about um, planning when we're look, looking at people moving out of home. So we've got our matrix here, so you can see that our green side which is our go side, is our individualised living models, which we believe provide the most choice and control for people who are um, considering moving out of home. And we've got our red side here, which is our predetermined housing arrangements, which is our more traditional vein of thinking about uh, disability housing. On the green side, uh, we've got these, uh, these three, way, three main ways that we see uh, as being really promoting choice and control uh, for people with disabilities. Living alone with a chosen friend, so this is one where you might have a few people, three people that get together and decide to rent a property together and then share supports um, and share funding from the NDIA 
that could be on a sill budget or it could be outside of the sill budget, it could be on a, a core budget and um, sharing funds depending on if the group people require a sleepover or not. Um, so we believe that this is a really um, great model for you know, having that flexibility that patterns the conditions of everyday life for most uh, young people when they move out of home. Um, and the next one along we've got uh, uh, home sharing and co-residency which is uh, we've, we've seen a lot of this happening in Victoria which is our lead model, our lead tenant model. So um, a person with a disability lives with a person who doesn't have a disability or people with disabilities live with, live with a person who doesn't have a disability and um, the uh, people with disability can self-manage uh, or plan manage a part of their core budget and that can be paid to the lead tenant um, in lieu of rent and then that person who lives in the house without a disability um, they have some responsibilities uh, that they adhere to um, in the house. But for the most part, they're a normal uh, tenant in the property. They're, they're just like anyone else, but it's an arrangement where the, um, the rent can be can be paid for that person and they might provide, say, 10 hours of support a week. It might be a couple of hours in the morning supporting people to get up. And the people that live in those properties also have their own package of supports where staff come in and might help them with meals or, or to do those things. And this model has been really attractive to our families because um, you know, there's a person who's living in the property, has a pair of eyes around, it's, it's a, a free sleepover most, night, most nights of the week. And um, it also, again, patterns those conditions of everyday living for people in Australian communities. It's a really normalised way for people to live. We really like it. The last one we like a lot is intentional community, or what's now being um, re-termed as deliberate development. So um, intentional communities, traditionally, you might think about you know, um, dancing around in a kind of uh, hippie commune kind of way, and uh, you know that's kind of become less attractive to to the families that we've talked about. But we're seeing deliberate development models such as um, the Nightingale model um, of of uh, development, where um, there's a, a a ballot people buy into, say, an apartment complex, and that complex has a lot of shared spaces where people, uh, so there's no one has a laundry in their house, they all have shared laundries, um, shared recreational facilities, shared rooftops, and our families really like this because there's informal settings where people with disabilities can have interactions and relationships with people in the community, um, and those 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 uh, those providers who are doing that, so like Nightingale, 30% of their um, of their their uh, selections when they when they're balloting out who's going to be able to buy these apartments go to people with disabilities and first responders. So it's a really cool and inclusive way that um, for people who are starting thinking about apartment, apartment living, um, which is obviously very popular in metro areas such as Melbourne. Um, then we've got our predetermined housing arrangements. It's red and we don't say don't go there, but we say stop and think about it because um, these uh, models traditionally have not promoted so much choice and control. So shared supported accommodation has been the default mechanism of housing and support for people with disabilities since deinstitutionalisation and was never supposed to be a long-term solution to deinstitutionalisation. It was always supposed to be a stepping stone. Um, people uh, moving out into the community from CIUs, but people ended up in CIUs and they stayed there. And um, uh, when we have five people with disabilities that are living in the place which has got a lot of predetermination, we obviously don't have a lot of choice and control. So if we're having spag bowl on Tuesday night, that's what we're having. If we're going to go bowling on Thursday, you're coming bowling on Thursday. So um, we say stop and think about this and say, um, can we think of a different way to um, to meet those those needs that a lot of especially older families have, like security and um, safety and um, you know, continuity, and, you know, extended tenancy, that kind of stuff. Can we think of a different way to do that? Um, through uh, working with a support coordinator um, for IHS before we think about looking at uh, group homes. And large-scale housing projects, we know the NDIS is moving away from these in a big way. Um, even legacy stock SDAs are going to be um, removed from the pricing tables within the next five years. So um, we, we don't like the idea of um, any kind of congregation or segregation of people with disabilities. And it's, there's a lot of different ways people still um, do large-scale housing projects in ways that are, are trying to be innovative, but we say let's first think about those those, um, those planning processes around uh, choice and control. So what is IHS? So the work that we do is uh, it's falls under support coordination and it's a new way of thinking uh, about housing. So think of an IHS worker as um, 
someone uh, who's linking you to services that are specific, specifically for housing. So, um, and it, it's right from the person who's just looking to move in with some friends and to share supports and navigating that process in terms of the funding, right through to a person who has very complex needs who requires an SDA response and, um, and navigating that process to generate funding and to think about um, matching and, and, and who the person might live with and all of that kind of stuff. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole process. So um, designed for participants who have a goal of moving out of home. So um, I think I go on to, to, to the next slide, but you, you've got to have one of your first two goals as to move out of home within the plan period or to do some really comprehensive exploration of what your housing options are in the plan period. So if you want to have this funded, um, you make sure it's one of your first two goals. Um, working from strengths and closely with Families. So we, we, we sit down with our families and participants and say, you know, where do you where would you guys like to, to see yourselves in, in the future, and, and how how can we support you to get there? And we can um, then uh, use our um, allied health funding to see what's actually possible because that's going to determine, determine what the NDI is going to fund. So it's about a 70 30 split of uh, actually investigating uh, and working in the background to about 30 percent of actually participant face time. Um, we work in, um, in conjunction with regular support coordinators quite a lot as well because um, if a person does move out of home then obviously the rest of their plan is going to be affected in, in, in the direction of what the funding is being used for. Um, so I'll talk about that uh, in the plan. So if you're looking for a support coordinator to do this work they should have a really really good knowledge of mainstream and SDA housing mechanisms. So, you know, you need to be able to have someone that's going to be able to walk you through uh, public, community and social housing, those lead tenant models we talked about, um, SDA and everything in between, shared supported accommodation in general. Um, and one of the lessons we've taken from doing this is that change is struggle and family readiness is really important before starting this work. So, you know, um, before we get to putting goals into plans and, and engaging with an IHS support coordinator, it's really important to consider if you're ready and um, to, to think about uh, this because, like I said, that funding is for a plan period and usually for, for two years. So um, if you want to start doing this stuff, it's best to be, be ready and to be, and to be um, ready to start thinking about this uh, openly. Can I just um, ask a question on that? Sure. So do you find that some of your participants um, will have done some, some thinking before they, they put the goal in their in their plan. Yeah. What, kind of, what does that usually look like for, for your people? Yeah, so I guess going back to 2016, um, we had a lot of participants with EHOP, which was the previous name for IHS. Um, and uh, we had a lot of people with it in their, in their um, plans, and it was maybe a goal four or a goal five, and it was being funded at 75 hours of support coordination and about 50 hours of allied health, which is a lot of, of, fun, of funding and quite often um, the funding either wasn't used because the families weren't quite ready, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion that went into it but it wasn't, um, there was no outcomes. So the NDIA quickly figured out what that, that was happening and they put a, a, a few more um, restrictions on who that's going to receive the funding. Um, so a lot of our families who come to us for IHS are um, actually at the point where they really need someone to support them because they're in a crisis point they need to find some housing, or um, they are actually generally now, um, are, are, they, they are the ones that are putting these goals in plans first, first up. So they come, they're coming to us with a few ideas about what they'd like to do, and it's our, it's, it's our become our work to work with those families to actually say, okay, yes, this idea is it's really valid and we can work through this and, and you know, the, the, the right funding is going to be available for this outcome. And other people, um, you know, maybe come to us and say, "This is what we want," and then it's our job to kind of guide them through the process of saying, "Well, have we thought about other options?" Um, so yes, a lot of families are now coming to us with with, um, with some visions. And that's partly as well because the um, as soon as you kind of have it in your plan, the, the clock starts ticking on this two-year kind of period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's yeah, and, and we we suggest to our families, you know, if they. If at the end of year one, what they've found out is that they need more time to, to, to think about it, we would say let's move away from putting that in again and let's let's give it another you know, little bit of time. We've given you some information, now you can explore those options we've worked on and then when you guys have made some more decisions or maybe you've 
found out that you need to be more financially ready to make the decision that you want, um, then you know going back to going back to doing those capacity building supports and and before you come back round to having IHS for your second year. Yeah, right. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah cool. Okay. So uh, the funding for support coordination provides a court with uh, to work with families and to establish housing vision. Uh, looking at those skill development areas that are needed, natural and formal support, so really talking about capacity building. If I'm moving out with three more nights, what do I need to learn um, in terms of you know, the general housekeeping and also other things about safety, travel training, transport, uh, but most importantly um, is that social uh, relation and how to get on with my housemate. That's, that's the biggest barrier that we've found to um, people who are decided to move out with friends or into any situation is uh, working through those uh, really hard things. Someone ate my sandwich in the fridge, I was looking forward to it, I don't want to live with you anymore, how do I deal with that? Sounds like my experience so, when I first started share housing as well. Probably. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, typical for a lot of us, but I think when you um, get disability sometimes it can be very, um, very uh, you know, compounding. Um, especially, you know, sometimes if Especially if you've lived at home all your life and mum and dad have done maybe quite a bit of stuff for you, um, it can be quite challenging when you are in a property where you're not the, the only person who's, who's there. Um, so we work through those things and we have some, um, some really uh, you know, detailed um, stuff with role plays and that kind of stuff that we work through with our guys on, um, on dealing with confrontation. Um, support coordinator will prepare a plan for SDA eligibility testing if required, so that's our role as well, which has become my main body of work. Um, the OT stuff, um, which is uh, funded for the uh, specialist therapy, so um, OT, comms, for like pages, psych, mobility, so all of these assessments are going to be used to build a picture of what will be funded by the NDIA towards your housing outcome. So. Um, in the hierarchy of reasonable necessary supports, your your assistive technology, sorry, your um, your um, allied health reporting is the is the, the very top um, when considering reasonable necessary. Then the participant voice, then the family voice, and then the support coordinator voice. So we we rely heavily on um, those uh, specialist therapist reports um, to generate funding outcomes for specific housing visions. Um, and also, we use the, this, these hours uh, for those intensive skill development things, or all these all these tools for, you know, assistive technology or, or those kind of things that can be used to help a person to be more independent. Um, so we we're talking about SDA and IHS. So, uh, like I said before, previously called EHOP and EHO, now IHS. Um, and then I always say this, but Aralorn put the EHOP to print. It was a large mistake <laughs> because uh, it changes regularly, it seems. Um, there's been a perception in Victoria and Australia-wide that the funding no longer exists. It does exist, um, and it's still definitely available. Um, and if you are wanting this funding in your plan and your planner has said that it doesn't exist, um, I would suggest going into your planning meeting with a letter saying that you want investigating housing solutions, that you want support coordination, you want capacity building daily living funds for your um, for your uh, um, allied health assessments and reporting. And uh, if they are asking any questions and saying that it doesn't exist, just put please contact Tony McGuinness. Sorry, Tony, you probably get a few contacts now, but um, yeah, it could be. <laughs> Tony will confirm that it's still it's still happening. So um, that again is after you've already done the really careful thinking about is this what I want? This is not that's right, yeah. This is not the funding you ask for when you're preparing to figure out is this what I want? That's right, yeah. I mean, so you know, not knowing what you want isn't a bad thing, but knowing that you want something is the is the place to start. So if you don't know what you want, that's what you know, investigating housing solutions is all about. Finding out, investigating and finding out what I want. But if you know that you want to move out, but you're just not sure how, then it's the time to ask for IHS. If you're not sure if you want to move out, or you maybe don't want to move out, it's not the time to ask for IHS. Yeah. So um, IHS support coordination is pathway to SDA. So uh, it's our job to write housing plans and to be really well versed in writing housing plans for SDA. But it's not only the path 
pathway to FTA. It might be the pathway to other housing options too. Absolutely, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. So yeah, as I said before, it's it's from uh, the IHS work goes from if you want to move out with your mate or you want to move out by yourself and you need to navigate that, then that the IHS as program is as perfect for you. If you have a very complex disability and you want to find out what your options are in terms of the SDA world, then that's our, our job as well to work with you and, and, and your, your multidisciplinary team to define the right kind of SDA and then to go about um, you know, answering those stipulations of the SDA rule to generate an SDA response if it is uh, required. So, yeah, some key learnings we've had from doing this work around SDA in particular. Families assume their adult child will be eligible for a group home by default if they're on the DSR. So we get this most of the time. We get a request from a family. It will drop into my uh, message bank or I'll get a call or an email. And it will be, um, hi court, I, want, I, wasn't, I was on the DSR. I need to move into a group home. Um, I'm eligible, uh, so please let's get it going. I want to find out how I can get into a group home. Disability support. Sorry, disability support register. Sorry, yeah. Okay, right. So, uh, that's a, so that might be a Victorian thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, a Victorian thing with the DSR. That was the mechanism for entering into uh, yeah. entering into into group homes. Um, and so, yeah. Now we've had to tell families, hey, look, SDA is for six percent of people, or that that concludes all SDA. And in Victoria, our group homes are classed as specialist disability accommodation now. So um, participants who are eligible for SIL and not SDA are facing a, facing a housing, afford housing affordability issue just like the rest of us. Um, and um, so it's, it's not a really, you know, the, we've got this portable support now, um, and which is fantastic, but we're trying to find properties in which we can deliver the support. Um, and so properties that are not SDA, uh, if you're not eligible for SDA but you are eligible for SIL, there's still a lot of rules around who can provide supported independent living in Victoria um, because of our fire restrictions. So must have fire sprinklers in the, in the property to provide SIL in Victoria. So yeah, this, this have been, there's been some of the things that have been difficult for us. Um, and as you say, I mean the affordability issue is something that's across the board uh, yeah. for all people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even, you know, everyone we're considering um, you know, private rentals, if you're on a disability support pension and you want to live by yourself, well, you know, that's probably not going to happen unless you, you know, found somewhere that's very affordable and that may not be in a location that's going to promote your independence. Um, so, um, let's talk about the um, main categories that Araluan's um, community call fall into. So we've fallen into SDA robust and SDA improved mobility. So the things that we've learned about um, improved livability so far is it's very hard to prove in our plans that a person requires the elements specified by the NDIA. So um, there's uh, in the in the SDA pricing guide and payments guide um, the the indicators that a uh, person requires improved livability would be that they require um, improved wayfinding, uh, direct lines of sight for for, for key staff, uh, luminous contrast for people with sensory or um, sensory needs um, and it's really really hard to prove that those are going to be able to be provided in an SDA and an SDA only and that they couldn't be provided in a standard house so um, in all of the um, cases apart from the, in all of the new build cases that I've worked on the NDIA has turned down the uh, SDA request because of that but when those have gone to the administrative appeals tribunal uh, both times have been successful in getting that funded for new builds. So um, yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's interesting, and uh, I believe that this is going to be looked at by the um, NDIA, um, and uh, that this has been definitely reported on in a recent CAFU and chair review. Um, so uh, the next part we work under is robust quite often as well for our participants. Um, and some good news is that we're receiving eligibility for SDA at the robust level in plans now, which we hadn't in the past, but submitted quite a few. And uh, it was around um, not uh, showing that the housing options had been fully explored, um, when of course if you've got an extremely complex um, disability which results in behaviours of concern and property damage and harm to others, it's pretty much impossible for you to go and explore other housing options or to even try to have a look at what's out there when 
you know, um, you're kind of naturally excluded from doing that by your behaviours. So we are now seeing eligibility for robust at one to one and one to two ratio. So thanks, NDIA. It's it's great. Um, so some barriers to SDA, allied health professionals are underskilled in writing specific SDA specific reports. So this has been a really big one for us. So um, I've had to actually work with providers to help them understand and to develop templates for writing SDA reports and to look at the rule and to answer parts of the rule. That is an absolute nightmare to try and write a housing plan which answers the rule if you haven't got a really, really good OT report which is being written to the rule and, and the, the, the author understands the rule and is um, writing in a way that you can easily quote without having to dig through and try and pull sections out of the report to try and fit suit. So having an LA professional on site who's LA health professional on site as an OT or a psych that understands the rule, understands the SDA and understands what you're trying to get from them is really important um, and they're not, there's not a whole lot of those around. It sounds um, like you're fluent in the rule. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, so you've heard it over and over and um, yeah, yeah. you prepare your report really uh, kind of point to point against the rule, is that? Yep, so you write it as, as you would frame any legal kind of reporting. You don't give any room for them to say no. And the people that are going to be reading these housing plans, they may not have any experience with disability at all. They might be a policy expert. So they're going to be looking at the SDA rule and they're going to be looking at your housing plan and all they want to be able to do is absolutely answer each part of the rule with what you provided. So um, yeah, that, that, that's what you need to do. You need to make sure that you use that hierarchy and that, you, um, you know, uh, that, you're, that you're writing to the rule and you're, you're quoting your, your allied health against the rule directly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So support coordinators for IHS are very rare. We've got a lot of support coordinators here who do housing as well as um, as, as general support coordination, which is great, and that's that's really cool. Um, but up until now, we've had a real um, lack of plans being um, approved for SDA, and I, it's my belief that you 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 could you could have two teams as Aralun does. One does support coordination, and one does IHS, but um, you, you really isn't as a support coordinator dedicating to a housing outcome is really important, and, um, especially if you're considering SDA. Um, Timeframes on eligibility results from NDI can vary. It's improving, yet. So it used to be between four and six months, and now we're seeing between two and four months, which is an improvement. It's great. Yeah. So writing housing plans. Um, and here's, uh, again, I've talked about the hierarchy of reasonable necessary. So, um, you know, quoting your allied health first. And then what I like to do is I like to, um, as, when, as often as I can, quote from the allied health um, and then uh, back that up with a direct quote from the participant. So having the participant voice uh, mirroring or adding to um, what the allied health has been saying. So. For example, you might talk about if a person was looking to exit residential aged care, you might have a statement about the person's function and how it's been uh, not been able to um, be maintained or improved in, in residential aged care and how an SDA response is the right response. And then a statement from the participant in their own words about how living in residential aged care has affected their function. And um, that can be quite a compelling argument um, for when you're writing a plan against the rule. Um, so there's no, no formal training for allied health, I've just talked about this, so it might be your role to actually talk to your OT or your psych about SDA and about the rule and about what you're actually wanting them to, to um, frame their, their thinking around. Uh, don't work the rule from start to finish, build the section to trial evidence from the allied health first, this is really important. Uh, it can be very frustrating, uh, I started off my reporting and just looking at the rule and saying, and just slogging through, but I found that I was able to work it um, in my stronger sections first. I kind of like doing that. Um, yeah, so our role as support coordinators isn't uh, the detail. It's making the report about a person. So your, your role as the author of a housing plan is to show colour of the person's life and how the SDA response is going to have this fantastic um, outcome. And it's not about you know, your, your boring stuff and your functional stuff. That, leave that to the allied health. Your, your role to make this person 
shine and to show them how um, this funding could change their life forever. Um, and I've just said that again in a different way just there. We're not advocates. This is really important as well. A lot of support coordinators get really tied down in this dual role of being a support coordinator and an advocate. And first of all, it's 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 uh, it's, it's not uh, is it illegal? I don't know if it's illegal, but it's against the policy. So the NDI has been very clear about this. Um, support coordinators are not to act as advocates. And why would you want to? <laughs> Your job is stressful enough. Um, without trying to be an advocate as well. Link to the right services, look for you know your local advocacy and um, and link to that service. That's the, the goal of support coordination is to link to service. So um, yeah, th this is a really challenging uh, journey, SDA, for, for people um, who are setting out their SDA journeys. Um, it's telling a story again, it's dredging up all of the really hard stuff, especially if you're talking about personal areas of concern how that may be impacting on the family life. Um, it's, it's, uh, um, it, can, it can be really, really, really challenging. So referring to counselling and support services for your participants and the families that surround them and all the natural supports is really important at this time. Um, otherwise, again, sometimes you can actually be um, the, the bearer of a few of those uh, burdens as well. So, yeah, refer to service. So, um, Alison, I know that you had some questions that you had posted for me um, last time. I have written some of them here, but did you want to just kind of bring the ones up you had and ask all of them because we've got a bit more time now? Or yeah, sure. Just and, and we have covered some of them already, so okay, you cool. talked okay. before about your role, uh, whether it always involves having to apply for SDA, but, but your experience okay. is that no, that, that it's um, a range of housing options. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, the amount of time that you have to work with people. Okay, cool. So we'll, maybe we'll just work through these ones. Yeah. So yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, it's cool. Yeah. So uh, how much time do you work with people on housing options? So um, it's typically for an SDA, if a, if a person has, um, you know, quite um, obviously got a very significant disability, and the planner thinks that they might be a candidate for SDA, um, the um, planner will put it up to. Uh, to 100 hours, but typically between 50 and 75. Um, and to to look at um, you might make getting that housing plan together, working with those therapists, um, and it might be from the ground up to actually educate them around the SDA rules, which can take a lot of time. Um, and then to have revisions of the material as well before you are starting to write your plan. Um, so I think for a person who's looking to move out with their mate. Um, you might ask for 50 hours or something like that, and then for an SDA between 50 to 75 is usually around how much time we have. Um, and you know, because it can be across two plans, um, you know, the first year can be really exploring, and the second year can be really drilling down. And you've done a lot of that background in the first year, and the second year might be actually supporting the people to, um, you know, really look at, at the at the options. Who's the real estate agent that's going to understand me and my disability the best? How can I talk to a landlord, which is another thing we do, we do a rental readiness pack for those renters around um, why people with disability are actually the best tenants in the world. Um, because typically, and not always, but typically, you know, don't smoke, don't drink, aren't going to be playing music at midnight every night of the week and, um, you know, have staff that come and support them to do domestic duties and cleaning. Rent's paid on time from a pension every time. This, this is this is to a landlord. This is amazing. This is yeah, like, that's fantastic. How could you want a better? How could you ask for a better tenant? Um, and I say typically because I, I know a lot of the guys that I do work with. They like to turn the music up at midnight. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not a one size fits all sort of thing. So um, but that's all good. Um, so have uh, spent looking at. Uh, so yeah, there is a bit of there is flexibility. Um, so you know, um, I think. Uh, I think this question was really trying to get at, um, and you, I feel like you've answered it in that that this is this this is something that takes up all your time. You know, like yeah, you know, yeah, really take a great deal of time to kind of get this stuff happening. Yeah. working yeah, with yeah. your client base. Um, it's certainly yeah. a great state. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it is like we 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 live and breathe the housing part. Um, but we, you know, as we we've, we've done a lot of this work and we've, we've actually, um, you know, spent a lot of time talking to different providers and different organisations about, you know, how we can 
get people involved with what they're doing in terms of engaging their independence or looking for property or all that kind of stuff. Um, we find that when general support coordinators have, have questions about these kind of things, we're going to just ask them to help in those sort of steps. So that's another bonus to, to the role. People that may not be specifically looking for housing but might need a little bit of information about their current arrangement, um, we, can, we can help with that. Yeah. Um, some of the most innovative and positive housing solutions we've seen. Um, so yeah, that, that um, you know we've we've done a lot of work recently with a provider who's um, had uh, ten people who are SDA eligible moving into an apartment complex, and so um, we're overseeing the transition for all of those ten people to move into these um, these new high physical support apartments, and um, they're just amazing apartments. You know, just the level of sophistication and technology and the amount of uh, reduction of face-to-face -face support that can be had in those environments uh, is, is fantastic and amazing and the amount of choice and control is, is really cool. And when you talk about 10 people, um, that sounds like the kind of apartment block where there are maybe 100 people there and it's one person per floor, so it's not talking about a... a that's right, that's absolutely, yeah. that's right, yeah, so I wouldn't, I would, that's congregate living and we don't do that, that's in our rent size, yeah, 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 yeah. so um, we're talking about the salt and pepper model. Those apartments, so yeah, there's, there's people disabilities spread throughout the complex, and um, yeah, and having these these really great um, uh, you know high high tech apartments that can really engage a person who may have been living in residential aged care for the last ten years, and now they're you know from from the, from the 30, 30 to forty, and they're, they're forty and moving into this situation for the first time, and having this really amazing you know uh, potential and stuff. So, and in metro areas, you know, so um, really cool. Um, and the other stuff that we're really, really um, into is that lead tenant model. We, we really like that lead tenant model. You know, get, um, people with disabilities living alongside people who don't have a disability and having really, really good outcomes and just having these cruisy, fun um, households where people are, everyone's supported and everyone's having a great time and um, just the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the lessons that I've seen housemates learn from each other um, have been in no way um, tips to either side, you know, everyone learns from each other in those households and has a really good time. Um, and have you had um, particular success in sourcing housemates from any particular avenue or...? Um, so there are organisations in Victoria that do um, police checks and do, um, they do uh, look for lead tenants, they do look for home shares. So, um, The, the, the provider we've used has slipped my mind, but I can send it in an email. Um, sure, but we, probably be yeah, I think it's Hansa or or something like that that's the Australia wide. Um, yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. Sure yeah, but we've also at Araluen as well. We've done uh, police checks on people, and we've looked at um, you know at, looked at people as well, and, and the the lead tenant has been happy to do all that kind of stuff and have all those checks done as well. Um, and we've uh, kind of, because we've been guiding these people through our IHS through the whole process, that lead tenant's been really heavily involved in the process as well. So they've been, you know, they've, it hasn't just been I turn up one day and then I'm the, I'm the housemate. It's let's look at how, you know, let's, let's get this relationship going first. Let's do that tenant matching. Let's do that. It's just like, you know, we do with anyone else except the person doesn't have a disability and they're just part of, you know, the process, but because they have those additional roles and responsibilities, then they are paid for. They are they have their rent, rent reimbursed. Um, they do have you know that police check process as well, which is part of the things that we do. Um, and uh, we've had um, people that are working in IHS, and uh, you know an occupational therapist will start doing assistance with someone, and then they have a really really good time with the person, and then the OT says, hey, wait a minute, I, I want to move out of home. You want to move out of home. I'm doing this work with you, getting you ready to move out of home. Why don't we just Why don't we just move out of home together? And then you've got this really cool relationship where you've got this OT and this person living together, and this OT is fantastic, and this person's independence is going through the roof, and it's just really cool. So you find it find it in the oddest places, and um, yeah, you'd be surprised how many people are actually really willing to put their hands up and say, yeah, let's let's do this. So I would look at Polytechs that are doing. Um, Polytechnics that are doing disability accredited courses because maybe they can get a way to sign off some placement hours and also get some free rent in this um, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, have a have a really good think about it and and look at look at what's around. Is there disability courses out there that people might be interested in, in taking this on? Um, you know, we've had a lot of interest from 
um, uh, solo mums who have or sorry mums mums who have had their kids leave the, the home and, and everyone's flown the nest and they've worked in disability for a long time and then they said, well, well, no, you know, why don't I have someone that come and live with me and then, yeah. yeah. Great, that's great advice. Thanks. Yeah, cool. So, um, support coordinators who want to help others pursue a range of housing options. Um, I yeah. think I remember your response to this on the 16th, and it was tenacity and persistence. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's a, it's a very new thing. Um, anyone who's, who's wanted to get into this, um, or anyone who wants to pursue a range of, of options, is that you know don't. Don't consider any failures as setbacks because you know we, we we consider them as learnings. Like you know people move out of home um, and they move back home and then they try again and it's not a failure. There's there is no evidence to suggest that if you move out of home and it doesn't work out that you're never going to move out of home again. There's, there's that, that's a myth and people um, love to love to spout that myth. You know we have a lot of families that say, well, what if what if it doesn't work? Well, it, it's going to it's going to ruin their, their their future and how they think about it, and it's just not true. It doesn't happen like that. Again, it doesn't happen with my housing pathway. Yeah, that's right. And it's it's funny, you know, we we have this lens of disability around this stuff, yeah. you know, yeah. that we have this. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's 2018. Yeah, well, so <laughs> and, and and previously. Cool. All right. Thanks. I want to say thank you so much. Um, but so much for sharing your time with me and uh, your your wisdom and experience on this one because it's uh, really great to have this kind of conversation where we can yeah ask some of the, the big picture questions but also some of the mundane kind of small stuff that you're really able to speak to with um, great insight. So thanks again. Um, as everyone who is watching this will have known, we have posted this up on the Public Comment site for the Office of Disability um, with the Racial Fifth Amendment Services Directorate. And uh, thanks once more. Thank you very much for having me.